Hi guys, some of you will recognize this vehicle, the Ineos Grenadier. I featured this in the video last year. I think it was at Hampton Court, the concourse there. And it had a lot of response, a lot of interest. People were interested in finding out more about the vehicle. Of course, at that time, what I couldn't show you was the interior. So I'm here today at a very special preview of the new interior of this car. So just to give you a few details, of course, the Ineos Grenadier, inspired by a very famous Land Rover, let's just say that, um, clearly uh, similar to it in terms of looks. But it is a body on frame construction. It's got an old ladder frame uh, way of doing things. So it's kind of modern. It is brand new, of course, so it's kind of modern, but there's a refreshing old schoolness about it because it's picking up on certain things that off-roaders love to do. So what I want to look at today, of course, and BMW drivetrain, BMW engine, gearbox, all the rest of it. What I want to do today is to look at that interior because that's the key thing that we're here to do. And let's do that right after this. So here we are in, well, we haven't gotten in yet because I actually haven't gotten into this car yet. I've had a look around it, but I haven't gotten into it. And the reason being is because I want to see what it feels like. Now I've driven lots of the old Land Rover Defenders and for me it's six foot two with long legs. They've always been an uncomfortable experience, let's be absolutely honest. So this will be quite interesting. But just from opening the door, first impressions, nicely finished. I should just say that this car actually, the actual vehicle is a test mule. And what they've done is they've fitted this interior into this vehicle for the purposes of this uh, uh, display, this kind of debut of the interior. So, so it's not 100% working, that's why I can't turn anything on and I can't show you the dial. But the, so far it's really good, there's a mixture of materials on here, it looks really nice, it's very sophisticated and modern. Something very interesting here, there's something missing from the front of this uh, dashboard just over the steering wheel. There's no instrument panel, but there is a little screen. These seats are special material. It's, it's, a, it's a vinyl with a kind of plastic mix material here that is supposed to be uh, resistance to water, resistance to dust, and also sweat resistance. So it'd be good for the Middle East, although you will be able to get uh, leather seats and leather upholstery seats as well. These are Recaro seats. Right, time to get in here. It's quite tall, so there's a little bit of a step here, so I can grab hold of that. There is no grab handle here, so I'm just going to grab the top of the car from here and get in. Okay, right, so already this is tight. However, let me just move the seat back. Ah, there you go, that's different. Okay, so this is quite interesting. Let's shut that door. So right here, we've got this big central screen over here. And you'll be familiar with this gear lever. This is from a BMW. It's obviously got BMW transmission in it. Now this thing you would think is a BMW infotainment system, but apparently it's been heavily reconfigured because there's no instrument display in a traditional sense. So the instruments will take up uh, about a third of this space with the two thirds being infotainment. That's how they're going to make it work. You do get a display there that just gives you speed and warning lights. That's basically all that does. Now this steering wheel has this kind of wonderful, it's, it's actual saddle, saddle leather so the idea is that this will actually age with the car it's on here and it's also on the on the handbrake uh, lever as well and i'm sure that you'll be able to option it out and change it whatever you can do but this is something they've gone with for now it does have a straight uh, marker as well on the thing there are remotes on it there's got stereo remotes here and cruise control remotes here. it's not adaptive cruise it's not going overly complex they're trying to keep it simple um, but it does have some technology it will have reversing cameras available as an option um, uh, uh, but not self-parking or anything like that hydraulic steering so that's good not electric power steering now on the right side there's a little red button and in the middle of the button there's a bicycle and on the top of the bicycle it says toot so although you get a regular horn in the middle you get a little toot which is a very British thing I think it's almost like I want to beep at you but I don't want to be impolite about it so I'm gonna have a gentle toot just to ask you to please let me pass so that's what that says so that's that's gonna be a standard feature in the car now the biggest thing about this car is the console here because to me that looks like it's out of an aircraft you know it's supposed to be very functional very logical and there's another equivalent one here up the top it's got all these toggle switches and these kind of bars that protect the switches and the idea is that in along with the instrument panel it's accessible to your passengers as well so they can see it they can read it they can help you operate the vehicle so up here you've got, you'll have the diff lock mechanisms the crawl control all the differential lock off-road mode exterior lights interior lights assistance that's all 
all up here. There will also there are also redundant switches in here which you can have for your own uh, reasons. So, uh, but you will get a cutoff switch. So there will be a cutoff switch that will cut out the traction control, stability, airbag, all the rest of it. A big thing for when people like to go into the dunes. Now I will just say about this car. So I'm now sitting in the car. Headroom is not a problem. Visibility out the front, not a problem. I can see the front of the bonnet, so I can see exactly where that is. Nice mirrors are quite useful on that side. In terms of the rear, uh, we do have a wheel that's coming out, and you have that split uh, tailgate, so the barn door tailgate that they have, and that's got quite a big wide midsection to it. So you do have a bit of the rear cut out in that sense. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if that affects the driving, but of course you will have the side mirror, so that should be okay. Now, in terms of sitting, I do have plenty of headroom. I do have plenty of uh, shoulder room, not an issue. The interesting thing is that uh, there is a little bit of an intrusion on the left and the pedals are sort of skewed off to the right a little bit. So the accelerator is literally right up against the right side of the car and then next to that is the brake pedal. But there is a foot rest for the left uh, foot, but I would like a little bit more room myself because, you know, I do have uh, long legs and they're older legs so I have a little bit of a knee problem on this side but it's something that you could probably get used to I suppose you could put the seat further back yeah you can put the seat further back but then that to me now is a bit too far so it'll be interesting to see how the final production I should just add of course that this isn't the final production car this is a test mule and they have grafted this interior into it what else do you have here well like I said you've got the full banking controls you've got the high low so a traditional high low four-wheel drive lever you've got the i drive kind of system here so that will affect uh, operate the infotainment system, the OS system, cup holders, a, a cubby box and all the rest of it over here. But I have to say, I think the big feature about this car, apart from obviously this kind of cool saddle uh, leather covered steering wheel, will be the center console with all of this very aircraft style switches up here and up here. You do feel like ready for takeoff. I want to radio into the control tower and get clearance before I go off-roading. That's what this car is all about. Now that I've sampled the front of the car, I think I should check out what the rear seats are like, right? Let's do that. Here we go. So the door, uh, I could do with a little bit more of a wider opening, but reasonable height, good space. Again, using that step to help me get in. And here we go. Let's close that. Right then, so as you saw, I did adjust that seat for my driving position. So that's adjusted for me, six foot two, long legs. And I have to say, pretty good leg room back here. There's loads of room for my knees, no issue whatsoever. Wiggle room for the feet, not an issue, no issue down here as well. So actually, the rear space is, is pretty good. It's a little bit upright though. I am sitting upright, so it's, but that's, a, that's a, about par for off-roaders. I don't know if this is adjustable on this car, but, uh, it is, but it, these are Recaro seats again, and they have the same material as the front ones. Good headroom, as you'd imagine. So you could wear a top hat in here, no problem at all. You can actually rest your elbow on the windowsill, so that's good. Uh, less chance of claustrophobia because you've got quite a bit of glass area. Now, I was told that there will be versions of this available with a removable glass panels at the front, so you'll have a little bit more light coming in. They'll be on either side of that center console. Back here, you have two AC vents, so that's quite good. Uh, plug, and I think those must be, these are dummy versions, but I think that they are going to be USB points as well. So pretty good here. I think that the, you could easily get three people in here, no problem at all. Um, I tell you what, whilst we're here, why don't we just check out the boot as well and see what that's like. But uh, overall, so far, reasonably practical. Oh, it is a high vehicle, so it takes a little bit of getting out to. But there you go, so that's the rear of the car. A lot of people remarked on this, this is on here and on here, here. This is a great utility where you can mount stuff onto the actual vehicle. One change in the production car, I think I remember I mentioned that there are external compartments. They're not going to have these now because they found that there were security concerns about this sort of stuff. So there will be compartments, but they'll be accessible from inside, from the boot, rather than from here. Talking to the boot, let's go check that out. So here we are, this is actually a barn door style, it's a split tailgate if you like, and you start by, you also get this ladder so you can go onto the roof, and of course they've got the roof rails and stuff, you can mount stuff up there if you want as well. So this is a great vehicle for overlanding, right? So you've got this smaller door, so that opens like that, and that can give you access to the interior. I should just mention that this isn't the fully finished interior. So this is just to give you an idea of the amount of space that's available. Obviously the, uh, the lining and stuff is not there. Then you've got a handle here, and then from there, you can pull that door open. Again, big wheel on the back. And if you're going to modify the vehicle, you may have even bigger wheels. 
that's quite a wide opening area. So that is a big open space for you to load stuff into. Of course, you can see now that the rear seats are split folding, so that will give you even more room. But just in terms of space to get stuff into here, wow, that's pretty good. So this is actually turning into a very practical and usable vehicle. I can't wait to drive it, but I think I'm gonna to have to wait a little while for that to happen. In the meantime, it's time to go and talk to somebody that knows a little bit more than me about this car. So I've managed to grab Mark Tennant, uh, a commercial director at Ineos Automotive, to find out a little mm. bit more about this car. So what is mm. the Ineos Grenadier? Define it, who is it for? Okay, so the Ineos Grenadier is hopefully you can see with a wheel at each corner, very boxy style, short overhangs front and rear, lots of ground clearance. It's an off-road vehicle. It's been designed and developed first and foremost to be very, very good in very challenging conditions. But um, it's also a car for the 21st century. So we've got that um, combination of utilitarian look, um, a, a very purposeful presence designed to tackle big off-road challenges, but it's also got to be comfortable, it's got to be modern, it's got to be up to date. So in terms of the interior, we've focused on making sure that just because you've got a utilitarian vehicle, you shouldn't have to suffer for it. Let's talk about that a little bit, because obviously, I mean, you've not mentioned mm. it, you're not going to mention it, but obviously there's mm. a resemblance to a very well-known mm. Land Rover, um, and that's clearly part of the identity of the car, mm. and that's showing you what it's about. Now, the interior mm. you haven't chosen to reveal mm. until today, and you've just, mm -hmm. I've just had a look at it myself. And it's a very interesting uh, format that mm. you've gone for mm -hmm. there, because I find that that's a very uh, airplane style, aeronautical style mm. console and stuff on there. Mm. Is there a deliberate attempt to set it apart from other vehicles, or is it purely about functionality? It's purely about functionality. So first of all, in terms of your first point, it's an off-road vehicle. There are certain parameters that you have to have to be good off-road, which I've just described in terms of the overhangs and so on. And, and um, I think there are a lot of um, inspirations for this vehicle. Um, you know, we look at the original Land Cruiser, we look at the Willys Jeep. Um, there are a number of inspirations, but fundamentally, if you want it to do that sort of a job, that's what it looks like. Yeah. Um, and to your other point, um, functionality, being built on purpose is, has always been at the core of what the Grenadier is about. So if we look at the interior and the switch gear and so on, we've taken a, a lead from a lot of industrial equipment, from heavy plant, from yeah. combine harvesters, yeah. from tractors, as well as boats and indeed aircraft. Yeah. So the idea there is to be really focused on everything being clear, clearly marked, clearly labelled, um, primary equipment to the fore, yeah. auxiliary equipment in that roof console, yeah. Um, there for when you need it less frequently yeah. um, and beyond that really thinking also about what customers are going to use this vehicle yeah. for and thinking about pre-wiring to auxiliary switches for mm. people who want to fit a winch or exterior yeah. lamps or whatever it may be. So there's plenty of redundant switches in there which you can use for those purposes as well. There, there are extra switches for, for, for tailoring, for customising, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well you say it's practical, mm. I say it's kind of cool as well mm. let's be honest. But, you know, so, uh, well it's great to hear you say that, so thank you. <laughs> So, in terms of the vehicle uh, in this market, mm. who do you think will be the customer here in the UK for a vehicle like this? I think in the UK there'll be quite a spread of customers. It'll be um, the farmers, it'll be the, um, the small businesses that need a commercial version of this. It's so important that we have a, a, a commercial vehicle which is back qualifying for small businesses. And there'll be a spread there through to the 4x4 enthusiasts whose weekends are all about going and getting properly muddy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in the middle, probably the biggest group are people who want to tow a horse box. Yeah. They want to take their rib down to the coast of the weekend, yeah. um, who are quite outdoorsy and adventure oriented yeah. and will use this very specialist vehicle for those sorts of specialisms in their lives. I want to move on to the global uh, scenario, but before mm. I do that, when we were talking about this just before we started mm. this, in yours, mm. What mm. is INEOS? Because it wasn't a name that was known to people in the mm. car community much until mm. now, right? So INEOS Group is, um, is, a, is a large private company, predominantly in the chemicals business. Um, it turns over about, would you believe, $60 billion a year. Wow. So it's a sizable organization. Um, it is indeed new to making cars. Yeah. Um, it's not new to supplying the automotive industry, though, because we do about $2 billion of turnover a year in supply to existing manufacturers and their suppliers. 
um, but we are new to, to, to making cars. And we're also quite new um, to sports activities. So you'll also have seen a big uptick in um, Ineos's involvement in Formula One with the Mercedes team, yes, yes. America's Cup for yeah. sailing, yeah. and the Ineos Grenadiers right yeah. now competing in the Tour de France in the cycling. Oh, and that's right. great for us because yeah. from a, an awareness point of view, we're the new kid on the block. Yeah. We've, um, we've got to um, bring the awareness of Ineos to a much wider public and that's where the, the sports activities are so helpful to promoting the Grenadier. So it sounds like Ineos is a global brand, it's involved in a lot of mm. different things. Is this, is, it, is this a British car or is this a global car? Uh, I think it's a bit of both to be honest. Um, the, 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 the company is British, the owners of Ineos are British. Um, uh, here we are in the UK um, and um, we've been rapidly growing as a team. I think we employ in, in the automotive business about 120 people in the UK mm -hmm. now. Um, Ineos Group employs about 6,000. Mm -hmm. um, the design inspiration, the commercial organisation, the parent company, all British. But like every vehicle these yeah. days, the, the supply base is global and um, strongly pan-European. Yeah. Um, we're building the vehicle on the continent. Um, but um, I think there's a very strong yeah. British f flair Where's to it this. Built? It's being built in Hamback. Right. So we acquired a, um, a plant from Mercedes-Benz right. where um, uh, the Smart um, was, right. was and is built. Right. So we're, we're a contract manufacturer now for, for Daimler. We're building right. Smart 4.2s, oh, EVs for right, them. Right. Um, and, um, and also that plant had received some significant investment from Daimler recently which enables us to, to put the Grenadier in there, into the body shop, into the new paint shop fairly readily. It's a great cross-pollinization mm. of different uh, mm. brands and sources, right? Because you're talking about building it at a Mercedes plant, but mm. you've got BMW drivetrain in this. Well, I think uh, the, the essence of the project was recognizing actually as a new player in the game that um, we needed to work with suppliers, with partners who knew what they were about. So having a technical partnership with BMW, having their inline sixes under the bonnet here, um, huge um, head start for us in terms of BMW's quality of, of powertrain and so on. Um, and similarly, we've, we're using Magna in, in Austria as our engineering partner who, who've got decades of history of building 4x4s. Yeah. So that recognition of the need to bring in expertise yeah. and work with the right partners has been, been core to yeah. getting us to where we are today. Yeah, I think the BMW will be a great choice. I love those mm. uh, straight sixes. They make yeah. the most silky Aren't straight they great? sixes. Yeah. Yeah, really yeah. Good. Let's bring this into the Middle yeah. East context. Yeah. Obviously, that's a big market for 4x4s. Four it's a market mm. that you will uh, be entering. You're planning, definitely mm. planning to enter that market. Uh, what's the, the rollout mm. timescale and what, are you, what stage are you at now in, mm. in terms of the Middle East context? So generally, where, where we are at now is, is testing, testing and more testing. So it's really important, particularly yeah. as a new player, that we put the vehicle through its paces with the engineers. So we're in the process of uh, accumulating about 1.8 million kilometers of mileage, about 300,000 of that will be off-road yep. and a good chunk of that will be in sand. Right. So um, bring it back, to, back to the Middle East. Middle East sand yeah. if rules allow. Yeah. So one of the challenges for the engineers with Covid has been yeah. where can you do your hot weather testing. So, yeah. um, But we, um, it's a key part of the, the development program. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of the timing question, we're looking to start deliveries globally in July next year mm -hmm. and let's just say the Middle East is going to be very much at the front of the of the line mm. for those first deliveries. And other key aspects or key mm. features that you've had to think about mm. in terms of the Middle East market when working on the car, particularly mm. this early stage? Um, it's been at the core from, from, from the start um, as a key market. So the obvious things in terms of the capabilities of the air conditioning system have yeah. had to take into account 50 degrees of, of yeah. heat or plus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so solar loading on the glass, all those normal things. Um, but we've also been, been thinking about cooling, thinking about dust ingress. We've yeah. got on this vehicle a raised air, air intake, which is a yeah. very popular feature in the Middle East yeah. for obvious reasons. Yeah. So um, it's been in the thinking. Um, likewise, the ability to, to clean out the vehicle to um, hose out the sand in the footwells and yeah. with the drain plugs we got in the floor. Yeah. So um, um, Middle East market's never been far from our minds in terms of the engineering development program. That makes sense. Two final questions. Mm. One is what about modifications? Because mm. in the Middle East, once they get hold of four by fours, we love to modify yeah. them. We love to do stuff yeah. to them. Is that yeah. something that you'll offer yeah. or aftermarket um, people? Um, we, we, we would love and we will love to embrace that yeah. because first of all, we will have a, a good range of of options and accessories as you'd expect 
uh, raise their intakes, roof racks and so on. Um, but also we kind of want to embrace the aftermarket yeah. because a lot of our hopefully future owners already have a lot of this kit. Yeah. So we've got on the vehicle, as you've seen, we've got these, the utility belt, the yeah. fixing system and the rear quarter panel, which allows people with a universal fixing system to add the kit that they may yeah. already have. Yeah, that's a really clever um, system, yeah. So generally we've got this view of open source yeah. um, that we recognize that a body on frame vehicle like yeah. this, ladder chassis, yeah. lends itself to yeah. modification. Yeah. So we welcome that. Um, we, we, we want people to make each and every Grenadier an individual. Yeah. I, I did say two final questions, but I'm going to stick another one in there because based <laughs> on what you've just said, yeah. there's, a, there's a refreshing level of, I'm not, it's not quite old schoolness, mm. but a reduced complexity mm. with this car, isn't mm. it? Is that, is that deliberate so that you're allowing people to do more with it? Yeah, it, we, we talk about rugged simplicity yeah. as, a, as at the core of the product as yeah. well. Um, uh, there are some, some pragmatic things to that, like you know, more ECUs, more things to yeah. go wrong. So, yeah. um, so simplicity is, yeah. is key. From a satellite navigation point yeah. of view, we haven't got a built-in sat-nav yeah. because Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, yeah. you use it on your own device and that's yeah. what most people are, are going with now. Yeah. It's always up to date. So, yeah. so yes, it's very much at the heart of it. But with that also comes yeah. that if you make it less complex, it's easier for people to adapt yeah. and make their own. Um, you, you, can't, you can't say there's a typical Grenadier customer. Yeah. Uh, we acknowledge and, and, and welcome the fact that everybody is an individual yeah. and we want the Grenadier to be as individual as the customers who own well, them. Well, it's an all new car, so it's open mm. to any opportunities, right? Exactly. So just, okay, so the, moving on to the final question, mm. positioning in terms of mm. budget and, you know, within, the, yeah. within markets. Yeah. So um, where are we aiming this? It's, you know, it's a, it's a modern vehicle. So if we look at a throwback to old 4x4s, mm with no airbags and very, very fairly primitive systems and so on. Um, we obviously couldn't do that. This is a new vehicle from the ground up, starting with that, that ladder frame, which is very strong, the Carraro axles to take you anywhere. The focus is on durability and longevity. So it's not an inexpensive vehicle, mm. um, but um, it's, got, it's the total package as an off-roader. Um, and um, it's a bit premature to talk um, Middle East pricing, mm. um, but relative to, um, to some vehicles in the class, it'll still be very affordable. Okay, and here in the UK? Here in the UK, where we have a commercial version, yeah. which will be of, of less interest, I think, in yeah. the Middle East, yeah. um, we're starting around £45,000 right. um, for the, for the two-seater commercial version, yeah. um, but um, we'll be a bit north of that when converted. Yeah. Um, to and local currency, well. and there is indeed yeah. a pickup version. So we'll have a yeah. double cab pickup later with a, a longer wheelbase. So we look forward to that um, in due course. Ah, you're looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to driving this. Yeah. That's what I'm looking forward to. Anyway, more on yeah. that soon, hopefully. But in the meantime, thanks so much, Mark, for talking to thanks, us. Thanks, my pleasure. Good to see you. Hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, make sure you're subscribing to youtube.com forward slash brown car guy and hit the bell icon and turn on notifications so you don't miss any of my videos. Whilst you're at it, subscribe to browncarguy.com and follow me on social media by just searching for my hashtag that's on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and even on TikTok. If you love my content, then please consider sponsoring and supporting it. And you can do that over at patreon.com forward slash brown car guy and you know what you can use my platforms to promote your product service or brand my youtube channel is now closing in on 3,000 subscribers as i record this total views are nearly 500,000, and the reach just over the last month is nearly 1 million. So join these amazing people as my patrons, including Muhammad Umaid in the UAE, Partha in India, a tech guru and social media consultant, find him on parthans.com, Tom Conway Gordon here in the UK, Isaac Beauchard in the US, he's got some great deals and cool cars at bespokeautos.com, Reza Adil, check him out at Alizade Cigars on Instagram, Mohammed Garson, business consultant, you can find him at wehms.com. Siraj Abbasi at Tiles Italia on Instagram for luxury floor and wall tiling. Mark Waddell in Canada. Zach Cogliani, a globe trotting pilot with amazing images for sale at zachcogliani.com. And last but not least, my school chum Shahir Haki. Thanks for watching. More cool vids on the way. Catch you again in the next one.